Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. Now, we have here a very special guest, and he is responsible for some of my most favorite horror movies growing up as a kid, but he's got an incredible backstory of how he got into that genre, how he kind of transitioned from those types of horror films to other horror films, and we're going to get into that a little bit today. Please welcome to the show, Tom McGoughlin. Tom, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Thanks. All right. Well, we're going to get right into this, man. We're going to jump in with both feet. But first, when it's our first time on the episode with a guest, we kind of like to start from the beginning. So obviously, we know you've done movies later on, but that's not really where you started out as a youngster. So kind of tell us a little bit about where you grew up and then what steps you took that led you into the movie making world. Okay. <laughs> um, well, there's actually a wonderful book that Joe Madri did on all of this. So if anybody has the least bit of interest in things that I'm not going to be able to cover here, uh, it's called uh, Strange Idea of Entertainment, Conversations with Tom McLaughlin. And he did an amazing job going from birth all the way up to, I guess, about two years ago is when the book finished. Is that on Amazon? Where is that available? That's on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll link that to the show notes on our show if anybody's right. interested and go pick that up. But uh, yeah, and the reason he did it is because, yeah, I, I had this sort of Forrest Gump kind of background where I just happened to be at a lot of major events and things over the years that just happened to be there. And then my careers kind of changed almost on the clock at every 10 years, something would shift. So Basically, uh, I was born in you know, California. I grew up in Culver City, which had all the old back lots of MGM back there, which were enormous acres and acres of movie sets. And I had a father who was a USC film student who had graduated in the late 40s. I inherited his dreams and his little eight millimeter camera. So me and my friends on the weekends would go into the back lot and make these movies. And they were anything from stuff that was going on in our lives, you know, parents that were abusive that we would mock in, the, in them as cartoons, or we'd be doing, you know, horror things or James Bond things or whatever it was that we were kind of into. And that was kind of what I really wanted to do. And my father was also a magician. So I got his magic, uh, you know, equipment and would do these shows for birthday parties and whatever and the money I'd make from that I would buy my film so it was sort of like I was into both magic and movies and then the Beatles hit in uh, 62 63 and all that went away <laughs> now it was like I'm going to be a rock and roller and you, you see the evidence still is here you know yes, decades <laughs> later um, but yeah father wanted to disown me about that point everybody you know couldn't understand why we were doing what we were doing but all we knew was the girls were screaming and yelling, you know, and they were excited to, you know, come and see our bands and we were terrible, but it didn't matter. You know, we were 15, 16 year olds trying to basically get laid. I mean, you know, it sort of got down to. So, um, you know, we did all the music that was kind of from the whole British invasion, the Stones, the Animals, all those people. And the band actually is called the Sloss. And one of the songs that was recorded was called Making Love and recorded it on like a little 45. Nobody would play it because the title was too controversial in the, in the mid 60s. So it kind of disappeared and the band eventually broke up. I wanted to be a more visual lead singer because that was my role trying to be the Mick Jagger, James Brown wannabe. Um, and I met Marcel Marceau who had come to uh -huh. town and he invited me to go to Paris to study mime. So I kind of ended that part of my career in 69 and 70 and went to Paris for a year to study mime. And I didn't know why I was doing it other than I thought I could possibly integrate it into the rock and roll. Um, but I found out I had an ability to write comedy, physical comedy. So when I came back to the United States a year later, I basically started performing on the streets, started writing material, got together with uh, somebody that, that was also had my ability of Phenia uh, and Katie. We formed an act and I formed a group called the LA Mime Company. Then Dick Van Dyke saw us performing, said, why don't you come on our show, our, you know, his show that he was doing in the mid seventies. Um, that led to me writing and directing these sketches, 
which got me into the Writers Guild. Then I started writing, you know, comedies and nobody was buying comedies, but they were buying horror. You know, these were the days when Halloween, you know, had taken off and, mm -hmm. and get me a low budget horror movie, you got a, a deal. So since everything was slasher, I decided I wanted to go much more gothic horror than the kind of classic hammer horror movies that I loved or the Edgar Allan Poe, you know, movies from uh, Roger Corman's company. Yep. So yep. I wrote one of those, which basically was a bloodless, you know, horror movie, but it had corpses, it had pus, it had maggots, you know, all these other disgusting elements. And, um, you know, it took quite a few years before finally, you know, we got backing for it. And, you know, that was sort of the calling card that led me to Friday the 13th, you know, to um, Dino De Laurentiis, who did my Date with an Angel comedy that I'd written some years before. Sometimes they come back. And then, you know, I suddenly turned around and went, oh, my God, I've done 42 feature length films. And it's like, because everything I did, I was looking for what's next, what's next. And it wasn't until Joe did the book that I realized that, holy shit, I did all that shit. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it's weird because you get on a roll and it's like you just want to keep making movies. And, and the way I could keep doing it was by doing things for, you know, a network. You know, I did a feature called The Unsaid with Andy Garcia, then back and did a miniseries and then cable, you know, USA Network, all these things that just allowed me to keep making movies. And that was really you know, what I wanted to do more than anything else. Yeah, and I mean, then, <clears throat> those names that you just spit out, uh, you know, Marcel Marceau, Dick Van Dyke, I mean, those are some huge names within their own industry. I mean, what was it like working with some of those guys? Because, I mean, that's just, that's not names that anybody can say they work with. I mean, Dick Van Dyke is just a damn legend, man. He, and still is. I yeah, mean, yeah, I, still is. I saw him just before the COVID hit, and, um, uh, you know, what is he now, 94, 5, 95 or something? And he's still as spry as can be, still as sharp as can be. You know, we had great fun talking, you know, about those days of doing that. But the thing that was amazing about that show is it wasn't just getting to work with Dick, who was, I mean, the most incredible human being in, in, in <laughs> face of the earth. I mean, I could never say enough great things about him. He lives up to all the hype that you've ever heard. But every time there was a guest star, I got to direct these people. And we're talking about Lucille Ball, mm -hmm. uh, Carol Brunette, um, uh, Freddie Prince, um, Tommy Smothers. I mean, all the big kind of stars at that time, Sid Caesar, you know, who created TV pantomime, you know, on your show of shows back in the 50s. I know for a lot of people, these names are like, who? But I mean, these were the ones that really kind of built the industry. And here I was, some 26-year-old kid telling them, you know, how to do this physical comedy. And the big ones were absolutely incredible. I mean, they listened, they went, how about this? And, and I mean, it was like perfect. The ones that were kind of the new and up and coming ones at that time, which was Chevy Chase and Flip Wilson were assholes. I mean, they were like, is that what you wanna do? You think that's funny? Okay, fine, I'll do it. But it was, it was weird, you know, the ones that really, you know, earned their wings and stuff were very respectful and they would take things and go, okay, let me translate that into what, how I would do that. And right. it, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I've heard um, from more than one person that Chevy Chase was not easy to work with at all. And this was the first year of Saturday Night Live. I mean, we were, our show was up for an Emmy as was Carol Burnett's show. But then there was like three Saturday Night Live episodes because that was their first year. So we knew we were going to lose to Saturday Night Live. Right. But it was great to get an Emmy nomination, you know, for, for my work on that show. Um, so it was, it, you know, as I said, I, I always ended up getting these weird things. Like, uh, you know, when I came back from Paris, Woody Allen hired me. And I had an afternoon with Woody Allen talking about sleep. legend. And uh, yeah, and the robot sequence that I was in and worked with him on. And Bette Midler, I had a little rehearsal studio in my back backyard. She came and kind of took over the studio for a number of months when she was doing the Divine Miss M on Broadway. So she asked me would I direct a, a section of that where she sang and did pantomime. So again, here I am, you know, in my own backyard with Bette Midler, who was <laughs> again one of the most incredible talents in the world so it's it's as i said it's just you know a very weird choice to go off and be a mind but it led to so many other things in my career 
Absolutely. Um, and then, of course, when I got to Jason, you know, I could basically direct a silent character in his, you know, the head tilts and the way he turned. And C.J. Graham was just incredible being an ex-military man, you know, and he just followed stuff to the letter, which was exactly the way, you know, I wanted Jason to look because we electrified him. And now he's going to move almost like Terminator, you know, right. just unstoppable. Speak, before we get into Jason Six, speaking of Dick Van Dyke, there was an episode I remember because I was grew up in the Nick at Night, you know, eras. That was big. And the Dick Van Dyke show would come on. And I remember one night, I don't know if it was Halloween or what it was, but it was a, it was a scary episode where they were in this cabin and like mm -hmm. the scary things kept happening. And I felt that it was so damn funny to me. I mean, it was scary as a kid, but then I got older. I appreciated the humor in it so much. Like I still laugh at it today and it's yeah. 2022 or, you know, is, I mean, is that the one where Mary Tyler Moore was in the closet with all the walnuts that she rolled out with all the, no, things? it was like, they went to a cabin. They were supposed to be filming a show, but they didn't know what they were filming. And this guy comes in and he's like saying, Oh, I bring firewood every night at a certain time. And he's Ooh. like, well, nobody's lived here. And he's like, that's right. Nobody's lived here for three years. And there's just, one by one, they all start disappearing, but they're, uh, they are in a closet. And then mm. finally it's just Dick left by himself. And then what was the bald guy that was like his agent or whatever that had the gag? Oh yeah, Carl Reiner. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, He appears in the window and he realizes that the gag is the film that they were supposed to be working on was just being filmed the whole time. It was them uh. scaring people. But I mean, just at that time, I remember watching it at such a young age. It was scary at the young age I was watching it. But then as I got older, I think I found it. It was on YouTube and Ooh. it was called Ghost of a Chance oh. was the name of it. And uh, it was it's still funny today. And I mean, that's that's saying something when you can make something way back then, black and white, and it still hold up now all these years later. I mean, yeah. that's just, you know, credit it to Dick and obviously everybody that worked on it. But a lot of those names that you named off, like you said, paved the work, uh, paved the way for TV and comedy and things to to come in the future um getting into jason six how did you land that particular role did you seek it out did you get recommended did you hear about it how did that come about for you well i was as i said you know my obsession really was my mentor was frank capra and i wanted to do movies like he did uh, mainly because i love the fact that I could see those movies with a modern day audience. And these are things that were made obviously in the thirties and forties. And they connected the, the, you know, the laughter, the roaring crowd, you know, that you wouldn't hear that kind of reaction on the modern comedies. And the whole idea that one person can make a difference in the world. And it really kind of almost became like a religion, you know, a spiritual mission to, to get that idea across that we need to be kind, we need to take care of each other, we need to sacrifice, you know, all these sort of, you know, just basic kind of good behavior and common sense things would be tied up in one of these characters who would have all this stuff against him, and then somehow he would make it through. And I, I just loved the way he did it with comedy and heart and things. And I was fortunate to meet him. I was fortunate to have a kind of a relationship with, you know, sending him my script on date with an angel and he'd give me notes and, you know, anytime I got discouraged, you'd go, just do it, just do it. And this was before the Nike ad, you know, that was the thing I remember, always remember, just do it. Um, and so that was kind of where I was going and date with an angel was that direction. So when Friday the 13th came along, I had turned down a lot of slasher movies um, because I just felt like, Halloween was like it for me. And I thought after that, I mean, Friday was gorier, certainly had a much more unique premise by finding out it was the mother. It wasn't, you know, it was a typical, you know, mask killer as it became right. later. Um, and it, it just, to me, you know, those things kind of maintained a uniqueness. And then as soon as you start trying to copy it and do all these weird things, with it, I just didn't really have the interest. But when I met with Frank, uh, Frank Mancuso, who was the son of the guy who ran Paramount and he was in charge of all the Friday the 13th, he said, well, I saw your One, Di One Dark Night movie. I loved the gothic horror aspect of what you had in there. I think you could do this really well. And the truth is we're in trouble. 
you know, we made part five, which we hoped we were going to, you know, get a huge audience because we thought, you know, everybody thought Jason was dead in part four. Now we're bringing him back. And they were so pissed off at the end that it wasn't really Jason. And you're left on this note with Tommy Jarvis looking in the mirror, you know, with the mask and things. It's like, oh, shit, man, you mean it's going to be Tommy Jarvis? Oh, fuck, man. We want Jason. So it was always two years before there were Friday the 13th. So it was now only one year and he's going, we got to get this in production. And I said, so what do you want with, from me? <laughs> he said, bring back Jason from the dead. I don't care how he, just bring him back. And what else? Anything else you want to do, I don't care. Is it going to put comedy in it? Because I, that's, you know, just don't make fun of Jason. I said, no, I would not keep him scary, but I want the characters to have a sense of humor. And of course, I'm thinking Capra, I'm thinking the screwball comedies of the of the, the 40s and things, rapid talk, you know, slang, wise ass, but you like these people. And right. I didn't want to see them die. I mean, and that was what I was hoping the audience would go, oh, don't kill her. Oh, man, I liked her as opposed to being in the theater with a lot of the slasher movies which just kill the bitch. Yeah, tear her head off. It's like, I, you know, that to me wasn't really what entertainment is supposed to be but for these guys you know that was it but it, again I didn't want to make it all about killing just women equal amount of guys go but the big thing was that bringing Jason back by stealing Frankenstein idea of the lightning you know bringing back now he's unstoppable and the kills are unimitatable you cannot turn somebody's head all the way around and pull it off you can't punch a man's heart out you can't do a, most of the things that he did in that so that also sort of to me you know i'm going to make it different in terms of the way he does kills i'm going to bring children in which has never been done before i'm going to have an underwater fight with tommy and you know jason um car chase you know all these different things that had not done before and had set a tone right from the beginning with Jason walking through the circle like James Bond and slashing, which tells you, you know what? We're going at this with a sense of humor, you know? And I thought the fans would fucking hate it. I really did. I was scared to death that they were not gonna respond well to it. And much to our surprise, you know, especially 35 years later, it's still like usually number one in terms of the, of the uh, sequels, you know, or at least in the top, you know, three in terms of what people loved. And a lot of it, I think, had to do with the fact that I tried to make a movie more than just a slasher film, right. uh, just killing people. Gave, you know, Tommy, obviously, the, our lead had an agenda, which was, I got to get Jason back into his resting place somehow. Um, and he had to do a little research to figure out how to do that. And of course, Jason was happy being dead. Tommy brings him back, so he's going to go after Tommy, and anybody in his way goes down. So, you know, both of them had something they wanted to accomplish, which gives it, you know, a little more form and structure uh, from that standpoint. So these were the things that I said, you know, this is what I want to do. I wrote it in a cemetery, <laughs> at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is right next to Paramount. So I kind of added all these elements that, to me, would make it fun. And it's still, of the 42 films I've done, it still was the most fun, you know, that I ever had on a set with all the people. We just shot all nights, and it was it was great down in Georgia. Man, okay. That was one thing I was going to ask you about where that was shot, because as we talked off camera, coming up, part six was the first Friday the 13th movie I had seen. You know, obviously, this was still VHS days. Yeah. We didn't have the VHSs laying around, so... That was, I guess, the, one of maybe new releases or whatever point in time it was when I seen it. So that was like my first introduction to Jason. So I went back after, at that point, you know, I'm hooked automatically. I love it. My family's like, our family night was horror movies. That was what we had. You know, we didn't have, you know, uh, the Chris, well, it's a wonderful life and all those things, which is nothing wrong with those movies, but we yeah. done it with horror movies. Yeah. So that was our thing. And so immediately I'm like, all right, well, I got to go back and see what all this other stuff is about. Cause I'm hearing my mom tell stories about how my dad took her on a date to see the first one. And the ending scared the hell out of her, you know, when he, uh, Ari Lima comes out of the water. Yeah. So I go back and I rent all of them and I buzz through all of them. And I'm like, you, you know, it was a little, it threw me for a big loop, even as a kid in part one, with it being the mother, then two, you know, definitely held its own. You see in Jason there three was good. Now I was too young to appreciate, I guess, the 3d factor when it come out. So I could, I didn't get that experience watching on VHS, but I'm sure at the time that had probably had to be pretty neat. 
Um, yeah. You know, then four was good, but I'm like you, five, I was just, I wasn't a fan of five. But, you know, the six, the way you brought it back in there, the way you did it, it was cool. And you even kind of hit on something way earlier than Wes Craven did because a lot of what he did with the Scream franchise, he would incorporate real life talking about movies into the movie. Mm -hmm. And at that scene when he's standing in front of that car, when a couple pulls up in that bug, you know, that's what she said. She's like, I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. Yeah. So you you incorporated that realism in there long before a lot of these other people did it. And those well, are the things that I appreciate. I, I don't know if you know this particular story, but um, after Friday the 13th, you know, they wanted me to do, a, you know, the next one, you know, part right. seven. And I said, I don't have any ideas. I would love to do it, but I don't know. And he said, well, what about Jason meets Freddie? I said, well, how are you going to do that? New Line has it. And, you know, you guys have, you know, Paramount has Jason. And he said, I'm working on it. And he comes back and says, well, now they wouldn't let go of it. But is there anything that you could think to do? And I went, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. How about Cheech and Chong meet Jason? And of course, he laughed his ass off and he said, that would be great. But I don't think it's the same audience. And I said, it is the same audience. It's the same age. It's the same, you know, smoking the same weed. You know, <laughs> they would go. And, you know, he goes, yeah, but the horror people are going to not like all the comedy and the, you know, the comedy people aren't going to like all the horror. And I said, I don't know, maybe I'm stupid, but I, I you know, it, so that didn't happen. So I then started looking, you know, for the, the next picture, which, you know, ended up being, um, you know, the, the Angel movie um, mm -hmm. because they introduced me to Dino. But then as time went on, you know, I would get all these, you know, I got offered, you know, Bride of Chucky and I went, no, nah, I've already done a sequel. You know, I had gone in on, on uh, the, the, the Freddy uh, part four um, and started talking about it. And they said, well, we're already shooting. I said, we didn't, you, don't, you don't have a director yet. Yeah, but we do this. We start shooting units. And I said, no, I, I can't do that. I've got to be in charge from the very beginning. Well, so Randy I, Harlan I did that, right? He wound up doing yeah. that one. Yeah. And I was a moron. I should have done it, you know, because it, you know, made Rennie's career, you know, and so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he went off after that. And I'm, I don't, I don't know if he's ever went back to anything quite horror like that or not, but, you know, he took that Freddy and then yeah. that led into tons of great action movies that he did. Like you said, launched his career for sure. Yeah. But the point I was trying to get to, because I tend to vamp on things, you know, back up and then get to there, is I received the script from my agent at one point, and it was called Scary Movie by Kevin Williamson. And I started reading it, and I'm going, this is like my movie. I mean, it's not, but it's that same tone. It's that same kind of making fun as you're doing it. And I thought it was a really good script. But at the same time, I thought, you know, to me, it wasn't the same as like doing it with Jason, it, right. you know, and it would probably work. But I said, you know, is there anything else that's not similar to what I've already done? And, the, you know, they started sending me other scripts and stuff. And finally, after about, I don't know, three months or so, I went, you know what, it's scary movie is that still available and he goes no nope. Wes Craven grabbed it and I went okay god bless him he's going to do a great <laughs> job so maybe eight years later I get a meeting with Kevin Williamson for one of the series that he was doing because he did a whole bunch of stuff in television oh yeah and we're talking and stuff and he said you know I got to tell you something your Jason Lives had such an impact on me writing Scary Movie, which of course turned into Scream. You know, I, I got to thank you. And I went, okay, <laughs> thank you. You know, I turned it down. He said, you did? I said, yeah, for that very reason. I thought it was too close. So, you know, irony of ironies. That is uh, absolutely crazy. I had no idea that that correlation existed, but me as a horror movie fan, I put those two and two together. So it makes perfect fucking sense what he's saying, because it's almost like he ripped it right out of that movie that's that's oh, he that's took he took the tone i mean kevin really did something wonderful which has had obviously a lot of uh sequels um and then prequels or whatever they call them now uh you know when you redo the whole thing uh but yeah the um return of the living dead i mean they were having a lot of humor in that but that hadn't come out yet so mm -hmm. i mean it was sort of happening you know because I felt like I couldn't do a sixth one and do it seriously. I just felt right. like the audience is like, come on, you know, do something else with it, but still deliver, you know, why we came. Well, 
your uh, your star, Tom, well, it was Tom Matthews, his real name, correct? Even though he played Tommy Jarvis. Yeah. Uh, I had seen him in a few of the Return of the Living Deads. And there was actually like, there was two. There was Return of the Living Dead and the Return of the Living Dead Part 2. Mm-hmm. And he played the same, it wasn't the same character, but it was still him and yeah. both of them. And that had a lot of comedic tones to it yeah. you know, and, and mixed in with horror. And those are, you know, really fun to watch. I still watch the one that's got all the punk rock stuff, you know, incorporated yeah. with it. That's one of my all time favorite movies there for sure. Yeah. Now, it's, you know, it had, I, I believe it, it came out maybe a few, I don't know when it came, it came out after us though, because I hadn't seen it. And I yeah. saw every horror movie. And so when he came in the door, I had no reference to his career whatsoever he just to me was what I was looking for you know uh, John Shepard wasn't going to do the the sequel um for whatever reason um some say it was religious some say it was you know he wanted more money than what Paramount wanted to pay but I had to replace somebody who sort of felt like him a little bit but I wanted him to be you know more wise cracking so him and Megan could have that mm-hmm. banter back and forth and also just a guy that was a you know a little more kind of macho you know in terms of his approach to it and tom you know was like the perfect package and here we are you know going on 36 years later we're still tight as can be as friends cj you know and i darcy demas tom fridley i mean all of us that went through this together still maintain I mean, we, you know, we obviously texting each other every week about stuff and sending jokes. And of course, we see each other at the conventions. So it has been like a family situation that's gone on far longer than anybody could have imagined. But that was because VHS and all these, you know, formats allowed these things to go into the homes and you'd watch it a hundred times. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One. Over and over and over again. Yeah. I probably shouldn't. Well, I'm sure the statute of limitations is up by now. But I was one of these guys that would dub them, you know, put the two yeah. VCRs in the car and watch them over and over. Because I had oh, yeah. every horror movie that you could think of, man, on, on VHS tapes. And I would just, my friends would get together and we would have these marathons, you know, run through, watch all the Freddies, all the Jasons, you know, Hellraisers and stuff like that. We loved yeah. um, scary movies. Now, you talked about CJ. I've actually, we spoke a couple of days, I think it was Saturday. I talked with his wife, Ruby, and he's coming on the show as well a little bit later on. Uh, How did you go about picking him for the Jason? Did you have anybody in mind? Was it just an interview portion and you seen him and it clicked? How did that go? Because, you know, as as we went on, Jason, even though even though that character is behind a mask and you never would know who it is, the way they play him has to be right. Like it has to be. They have to do it right. And I know that sounds weird for people where you don't have a speaking role and you can't see you. You would think anybody can do it, but that's not quite the case. How did you go about picking CJ for that role? Well, as irony would be with these things, the the man that we had to pick had to be a stunt coordinator so that they didn't have to pay for a stunt coordinator and then the stunt man to be Jason, which was sort of you know, something they kind of established, you know, whoever was doing Jason would also do the stunts. And CJ was like kind of the second in line, you know, but they didn't want me to, you know, pick him because he wasn't a stunt person. He was basically a a bodyguard bouncer, you know, kind of guy. And this guy we'd have, you know, we did uh, hire Dan Bradley was an incredible stunt coordinator and, you know, basically could you know, could do Jason. But when we shot the first week, Dan is a much more bulky guy. He's not fit like, you know, CJ is. And over that time period from the casting to when we started shooting, apparently he gained a lot of weight. Um, and, And Frank Mancuso's sister was the costume person. And she kept saying, we have to keep letting out the pants. We have to <laughs> keep doing this stuff. And I was like, you know, whatever. If you know the this is the Jason that you know we basically needed to go with because he could do both things. But then you know we got this marching orders from Paramount is like we're we're getting rid of Dan. We're bringing in you know CJ. And I was like, really? Uh, you know what? I, I need to tell him. He's like, no, it's already been done. He's gone. Yes, yeah, he's wow. coming in. So I didn't have shit to say about it. It was like boom. <laughs> but the second, you know, uh, 
CJ came aboard and we started to work together, it was like day and night in terms of what I was asking him to do and what he could do. And, um, and he did most of those stunts and things himself. Anyway, we had a stunt coordinate, coordinator, uh, Michael Nomad, who was one of the cops, you know, with the blonde hair. Mm -hmm. and he, he had been the guy that did all the stunts and stuff for, um, uh, what was the underwater uh, movie uh, with the older people? Um, uh, God, but Ron Howard, <laughs> I'm blanking on the name of it, where the, 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 they, that was like from outer space and they had these pods and- Yeah, it was uh, not Abyss, was it? No, it wasn't Abyss, but it, it was like a, a one, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. I just watched it recently. Um, as soon as I stop thinking, it'll, it'll find its way to that part of the brain and it'll come out of my mouth. Um, but anyway, he had done that stuff. So we knew we could do the underwater fight that, you know, we were planning. So that was, you know, certainly a bonus. But CJ, just as I said, like with Tom and the rest of these guys, we just became, you know, solid friends and tight. And, you know, I wrote um, Jason Never Dies, which is a sequel to my Friday, you know, uh, Jason Lives. I was going to uh, get I into that, yeah, yeah. Can't do anything about till this lawsuit, both sides settle. But, you know, when I was writing it, I was writing it for CJ, you know, what his strengths were and things. And I really wanted to say to the fans that, look, you know, if Halloween can back up and, you know, go, go back and kind of lose all the sequels, you know, I don't want to have to follow, you know, Jason goes to Mars, Jason goes to heaven, Jason goes across the street. I mean, you know, it's like, I just didn't think as, as much as there was good work in all of those and scary stuff, it just to me got off of what, you know, these things need to be. Yeah, um, you know, sure. uh, the, the space one kind of lost me. I couldn't get down with that one. But even, even, even fucking alien, you know, Jim Cameron came in with aliens and incredible and of course it opened a week before we opened so everybody that saw alien aliens that first week they came back with their friends second week friday the 13th was opening that weekend but it was like ah fuck that it's not even going to be jason and <laughs> so we we came in second instead of instead of first so it was already considered like eh, it didn't come out number one well that's because they you know they unfortunately the fans didn't want to go and that was a damn good movie, you know. I'm sure if I was given the choice, it's like, now let me go. Let's go see that again. I want to see your reaction to it. But right. then years later, when Ridley did that other Aliens movie, where they got off the ship and they were like on the planet and stuff, it to me it lost what makes that so great, which is you're caught in that world, in that ship, and that thing's in there, and you you know that claustrophobic aspect. And I feel Crystal Lake is the same thing. You get in there. And you, you know, where are you going to go? He's going to find you one way or the other. But you start, you know, going to these other places. It, you know, I, it just isn't the same thing to me. So when I wrote no, I the agree. sequel, I wanted him to come back, at, you know, 13 years later, so we could still make it look period, but do it in the dead of winter with six feet of snow. And, you know, and these girls cannot go anywhere except into these freezing temperatures. And, Crystal Lake is frozen over, you know, so we can actually have a chase across Crystal Lake. So I tried to incorporate all the stuff we've never seen before. But once again, you know, Jason, only females this time in this particular thing because of the circumstances that they're from a Catholic high school and they're all girls, tough ass <laughs> girls. So it's, you know, I've tried to put some different elements into it that we haven't seen, but still basically, you know, give the audience what the rules are, you know, why these things kind of work to begin with. Now you had some incredible kills in that particular one. I mean, no, uh, Ramon, I forgot the girl's name, but her head through that camper. Yeah. I, how did you come up with that? Did you know that was something you wanted to do? Did you want that at that visualization of her head coming through that camper? Was that something yeah. that kind of evolved? You already knew ahead of time. That's what you wanted. Yeah, it was it was a substitute kill from what I had originally had in there and changed my mind that it wasn't such a good idea. Um, when the Jason kills the paintballers and the macho paintballer guy who's got all the weapons and shit, you know, yeah. you know, that's where he got Roy. that. Roy, Roy, wasn't it Roy? <laughs> uh, no, uh, 
Roy was the was the nerdy one. What was what was his name? Um, I God. thought Roy was a tough one. I remember the nerdy one that got killed. I thought Roy was the tough one, the one that was pissed because he got put out by the girl. Because he had the machete in the woods. Yeah. He was the one chopping right. shit. Yeah. But originally, um, that's in the, the, the treatment, I believe, uh, which is in the back of my book. You know, Joe Madri actually put the treatment for the, the movie, which has Jason's father in it and a lot of things that didn't end up in the movie for various reasons. Um, one of the things that, that he had on, strapped on him was an Uzi. So the next time we saw Jason with the machete and you know all the other stuff, he had an Uzi strapped across him. So when he goes into the motorhome and you know Darcy, Nikki, you know, goes, you know, opens the door, you know, just blasted the shit out of it. And you know, and Court's <laughs> looking around and he does the same thing. And, and that's what you know kills both of them. And then I was like, you know, time, time, wait a minute. What are you thinking? You cannot give this guy a gun. <laughs> I mean, that is, you know, that takes all the power away. It's the gun doing it. You know, I personally have an issue with people that, you know, use guns, obviously, for the wrong reasons. Right. That I'm against them as much as I am. To, they get in the wrong hands all the time. And mm -hmm. I just didn't want Jason to have that kind of a thing. So it's like, I got to come up with something else. And I thought, all right, well, if he's got that knife. And if Court says, hey, Nikki, listen to this and turns up Alice Cooper and then whoop right into his ear, listen to this. And then with Nikki, I was going, what could he do in that thing? He'd be wrestling, you know, what if he pushed his face right into that and literally the indentation came out the other side and they figured out how to do that effect for me. And, you know, it's, it's great. And I mean, it's one of those very unique, you know, deaths in, in, yeah. in the series. That whole sequence right there, with putting her head through the wall then you like you said you got alice cooper what was that teenage frankenstein yeah. uh blasted on the radio then court gets the knife through his head and then that rv flipping when jason coming out of that thing i mean that's just one of those like i don't know whether they call it hero shots or just, just, iconic shots just iconic right shots yeah. yes standing on there just looking badass as can be yeah. um that was just just really really cool yeah um, that was literally the last shot of the movie and really you know, crashing that motor home was, you know, that was a big stunt. It didn't seem right. like it when you look at Michael Bay's car crashes and all that shit, right. but you know, with a RV, it, you know, it's a flimsy thing. So if you crash that thing that, you know, it's going to collapse Yeah. and we didn't want to kill this good old boy, you know, who's down there, you know, with his evil Knievel outfit and, you know, ready to do the stunt for us. And so, you know, we had to um, uh, enforce the whole thing with iron posts and stuff so it would hit and not collapse. And he had never done anything like this, but he knew he could do it. And so we put about eight cameras on it. And I was on my knees, brothers and sisters. I was on my knees praying, please, Lord, don't let this man die. So <laughs> that thing, when it went into the air, it was like, ah, uh, and down it came. And then, you know, he's like, put his hand out that, yeah, everything's great. And it's like, oh, thank God. And everybody, you know, all the cameras got the shot. And now the sun's starting to come up. And it's like, wait a minute, we got to set the thing on fire. We got to get him to come out. Of, you know, I think we had just one take um, to get that before the sun was going to come right over that hill. So it was the image exactly the way I wanted it to look. Like the caveman standing on top of the, you know, of the dinosaur after he's killed it, you know. And, you know, it, you know that, that kind of ultimate villain, you know, yet he looks like a hero you know like he's done yeah because jason went from really being the bad guy to the guy that we were all kind of digging to, to see what he was going to do you know and yeah he made that transition i think in the wrestling business uh call it a turn you yeah know, from a heel to baby face almost to a certain extent yeah um, in its own way yeah it's, it's, it, it happens sometimes you know obviously it happened with freddie you know it happened with chucky you know most of the 80s icons uh, you know horror icons kind of all became you know, fun, friendly, put them on a cereal box. Right. Uh, which we never expected. Hell, Freddie had pajamas for a, a period of time. I'm just like, <laughs> this guy's like his backstory is a convicted child murderer, molester. Like you got him wearing fucking pajamas. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, um, how did you come up with your idea for the ending of that one? Because that was a pretty cool little setup there with him going into the water and all that. And like you said before that, you mixed in all those kids that was a thing that had never been done before either that many kids like him going to that camp. I mean, all those things 
you know, played really well into each other. And then that final little, you know, duel between him and Tommy, how did you, did you already have that in mind? Did anything change along the way? Yeah. I mean, I, as I was writing it, I, I really didn't know where it was going. I, I, you know, sometimes when you're writing something and you have a limited amount of time, it's like you're taking dictation. Some Something's right. talking to you and you're just writing and go, oh, that works. Or, oh, shit, that doesn't work. And I noticed days I wrote by hand. You know, I wrote it in script format, but I wrote it all by hand. You know, so a typist would have to type it up. But, you know, the hand would just be going 90 miles an hour. But and I knew there had to be a confrontation between the two of them. Obviously, you know, you can't go toe to toe with Jason. He's got to come up with something else. But then, I, you know, there's kind of a classic motif, I guess you would call it, with, with uh, ghost movies, is that, you know, if something is haunting an area, it's because they, they're stuck and they can't get out, you know, get out of that. Obviously, Poltergeist was a perfect, you know, example of that. You know, they took the headstones, but they didn't take the bodies. Right. So my feeling was, is that, you know, Jason had, you know, died theoretically there. He needs to go back to the place that he originally died. And if you can just buy that concept, Tommy's objective was, I got to figure out some way to get him out to me, get a chain around him and, you know, put him down in the bottom of Crystal Lake. And then he's going to be, you know, helpless to do anything. He's not dead, which is what obviously that last image is with his eye, but he's down there. Um, and I don't know if you know about all the different lakes where people have made statues and yeah, put him there's down there. one I've seen where they, they they've got one just like that down at the bottom. I'm like, if yeah. I was to uh, stumble on something like that, I would just probably go ahead and have a fucking heart attack, like right there. <laughs> but for me, it was an incredible honor to take oh, you know, yeah, I bet. that yeah. image and actually do it, you know, and you got to get down there with scuba equipment to see it. So it's a very select audience that gets to see it. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the objective then is like, okay, Tommy knew what he had to do. It had to be difficult, you know, does putting fire around the boat mean a goddamn thing? No. Did it look cool? Yes. So, you know, the sort of rationalization is, is like, okay, if we put this around, now he's got to see where the fire is and that's where the boat is. So he's got to come up there. And as soon as he comes up, I'll get the noose on him and stuff. And of course he comes up the opposite way. Um, you know, so, you know, down he went. And then of course, it's like Jason kills him. You know, he's strapped him, but he, he looks like he's actually killed him. So then obviously our, our final girl has to get out there and, actually do the deed so it was a you know a double you know a team effort there to get jason down there and then stop him so you know that again was all sort of kind of the, the master plan and to have the kids there who never actually got hurt but you know they were they were there as bait and people were were like oh they're not going to kill kids are they really right nowadays they do i mean it's like that rule kind of went away at some point and you know you start seeing and it's like I don't know. I mean, I still have this, please don't, you know, stab a, a pregnant woman in the stomach, you know, don't right. kill the unborn. I mean, there's, there's some horror stuff that's like just too close to, you know, I, I grew up when the Manson thing happened and Sharon Tate and all that. So that was such a horrific thing to be in the same town with that happened. That to me is one of those lines that in horror, you know, it's very hard for me to accept crossing that. Yeah. It's just too, too much innocence. And if you're going to put kids in, just they're there to, to be, you know, nervous about what's going to happen. Um, and little, the little, you know, Nancy Ann character that he has the confrontation kind of with, there's something that happens there between them, um, which- that The one that said all, the prayers? Yeah. Yeah. There's kind of, there's all kind of speculation, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen. Why didn't he right. do anything? What was he sensing? Was he feeling like him as a little boy? You know, was he not, had he not seen a child in a long time? Up to the viewer, whatever they want. You know, I have my ultimate answer, uh, right. which will, you know, be revealed one day. But you know, I, I'd rather have people come up with their different theories. It's, it's kind of much more fun. Right. Everybody make it, you know, to their own interpretation, the viewer's interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he really did, other than the uh, character that, uh, what was, which court, was that Corey Feldman in four, the final chapter? Mm -hmm. uh, he really didn't have any, you know, interactions with younger kids that I'm aware of, at least not for, you know, a part of the movie like that. Yeah. Um, I know he, yeah. that was, he was the one that chopped him, 
I think ultimately with the machete and it, you know, he's it, when he fell down, it kind of sawed half his head yeah. off, which was an uh, amazing pretty, effect. Yes, it was. Day. I mean, just when I, like you said, when I went back and rewatched those, I'm like, oh, Jesus. I mean, I don't know how you do come back from that. And then obviously, you know, they throw the whole zinger in there with, yeah. you know, it not being Jason and that one. Um, and that was one thing I look forward to, too, and all watching them. You know, there's always just a small part of the movie where you see him without his mask. And typically it's at the end. Your yeah. zinger in that movie was it was at the beginning. And that was kind of cool, too. I remember watching as a kid, you know, seeing the maggots and everything like onto yeah. his face and and falling off. That was just really cool. Uh, did, that, did that take a long time to put together that opening scene there with the, the facial and all that stuff on there? I mean, we shot that all in one night, obviously, as, as these things go. But I was very fortunate that the production designer, um, he just he, he took a field and leveled it and made those, you know, so that it looked like the real one that you're going to see later. And all the tombstones found a tree that would be sort of the signature look for where the uh, his tombstone would be. All of that stuff was kind of arranged. And then it was just, yeah, trying to get all the beats in there and you know obviously his the, the dead Jason was a corpse that they had built and putting the maggots on and all the rest of that was you know like a separate thing but then getting him you know up and we had like a rain thing but it just didn't register on film that well so we ended up adding some optical rain so it looked a little more uh heavy so you could I could do the gag about him you know, gets the gas on him, but can't get the, you know. Yeah, can't light down, the lighter. Yeah, you know, thing lit. Um, but yeah, no, that was just like a, you know, a, a one night thing that um, everybody, you know, really pulled their weight and made it, made it happen. That's cool, man. Now you mentioned you wrote the sequel to it. What exactly is this hang up right now with this lawsuit? Is it, is it uh, that Paramount trying to hang on or what, what exactly is the, the deal here? Um, well, really quickly, because it's a very complicated, long time problem. Um, but what it got down to is that they were about to shoot um, another Friday the 13th. And I, as I understand it, they're actually going to use the camp that I used in Georgia uh, for it. And having seen the script, I personally didn't think it was very good. I think it would have been kind of a mistake. But they got a green light and they were going to do it. So, you know, who knows how it would have been. But kind of in the middle of all that, Victor Miller, who wrote the original script of Friday the 13th, it had, you know, it hit the, I guess it's 35 30 years. years. 30 years. 30 35 or 35, years. yeah. And if you didn't make a particular kind of deal at the very beginning of it, this, the story, the script goes back to the author. And so he made, you know, he got a, he got a very heavy duty lawyer, you know, that was incredibly powerful and went after, you know, Sean Cunningham saying that, you know, Victor should be getting paid money from all the other ones, you know, and from here on, you know, he shares in the profits, all that stuff. And Sean's like, no way. And they went into legal battles. I have no idea how much was spent as it went on for years and years <laughs> Um, and they finally, the judge voted for, you know, for to Victor. He would get the rights to the title Friday the 13th. He could remake Friday the 13th, the original, but he could not do Jason with a mask. Sean could call it, you know, Jason goes to Palm Springs and have Jason with the mask and do whatever he wants, but he can't call it Friday the 13th without Victor participating in the thing uh, um and then there's a whole thing about who owns the rights in europe you know one owns the friday but doesn't own the jason and i think it flips it's a very complicated settlement and in while once they had settled and i thought okay now i'm going to start writing you know my jason never dies because it looks like this is going to have to wind up by the time i finished it <laughs> uh sean appealed the judge's decision and the whole thing started up again for another two years so i had basically a script no one would even look at i mean it was like new line and warner brothers now own the rights you know to the merchandising and that paramount owns the rights to all the ones up until i guess it's part eight 
but whatever. Yeah. It was it Jason was goes to hell? Was Man- eight was when Manhattan. Nine was Jason goes to hell. Okay, I, I was that I, New Line or that, that was still Paramount, right? I think that one was close to when they were going to be on because at the end of nine, that's when you have Freddie's glove Freddy, comes yeah. out and brings right. the mask down, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was actually Kane Hodder's hand that yeah, done that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in, in that period, it's, that's that's kind of where the you know the, the the goods changed hands. So it was now like a new line thing. New right. line was then bought by Warner Brothers, so now Warner Brothers has it. Um, so they were the ones that, you know, my lawyer was appealing to, to say, well, just, you know, look at Tom's script. It's like, nope, we can't, we're not going to look at anything until we know what's going to happen here. We don't even know if we're going to, you know, continue with the franchise at all for, for this much time. I don't know where it lays right now. I've heard everything from, you know, possibly Blumhouse could step in, offer right. both of these guys a shit ton of money so that they can do the whole thing and, you know, then they take the rights. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I have another project that I can't quite talk about yet, but I literally spoke to Victor Miller on the phone about a month ago. And he said, Tom, I cannot say anything about any, I can't read anything. I can't, my lawyer, no, no, no. So, you know, there's nothing we can do, even though the thing has been settled, you know, after the appeal, we went right back to Victor. Sean just, I guess, hung it up. And, but there's something going on. And I think it gets down to, again, you know, Victor say he wants to remake his Friday the 13th in some fashion. And, you know, he's got to do it in a way that it doesn't infringe on anything that Sean has. And if Sean wants to call his Friday the 13th, he's got to make a deal with Victor for X amount of money, you know, for that to work out. It seems like if he was to do that he would have to remake number one almost exactly and not include the jason character because i get that decision where he owns the friday the 13th name but sean owns you know the jason character and the hockey mask because all that come after the fact you know what what, what jason in part two and then three you know the hockey mask so i kind of get that to a certain extent and it's been so long of a gap since i guess what the last jason film was the remake yeah. Um, that they did which had jason in it it didn't have his mother as a killer um there's been a lot of fan movies yes. made. i mean a, a ton of them there's been a the video yeah. game that's been wildly popular my son has a video game i play it with him sometimes i think it's really cool how you can choose to actually be jason and yeah. stop going away from him because i'm i have the uh old school nintendo game back in the day uh, regular we're talking regular nintendo here mm-hmm. where you had the counselors or whatever they had to go around and, and run from jason but this one's a really cool game and it just lets you know how much of a calling and you know a, a need there is for this uh whole story to continue because some of these fan movies man that have been made is has just been absolutely terrific to be put together you know by the fans yeah yeah um, i actually am involved uh in one of them um Oddly enough, because I wrote Jason's father in mine and then didn't get to shoot it because Frank said, no, we can't end on Jason's father being in this thing because the fans could think the next movie is going to be about Jason and his dad. And we, uh, I don't, we can't muck up anything like we did in part five, but right. I'm thinking it's going to change it. So, you know, I'm sorry, Tom, it's a great idea. We've never done it, but we just can't, you know, put it in the script. So, of course, most of the fans who know that um you know i've always asked about what that would be like and so on so this one fan uh up in in seattle or group of guys decided that they wanted to basically pick up the gauntlet and do jason's father and jason you know in the same movie and you know they you know first you know said i'm i okay with it and i said yeah boys go with it i mean shit i i i love the fact that everybody is like you know, we want a Jason movie and you know what, fuck it. We'll make it ourselves. Hey, anybody want to pay for this? Have your name on the movie? Great. Come on. You know, so they raise all this money and never in the history of movies has this occurred where, you know, the audience so badly wants something they're not getting, they're going to make it themselves. Right. And these are guys, a lot of them, you know, really have not any kind of filmmaking background, but they, they've learned, they've picked it up. They've got, you know, ideas and things. 
And you know, some of them are very savvy, other ones less so, but they do unorthodox things, which are kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And you know, put these things together. So they came back to me and they said, you know, would you be in the movie in the opening sequence as the grave digger, the gravekeeper, and have a, you know, a, a scene with CJ, who was playing Elias Voorhees? And I said, give me a plane ticket, I'm there. So it's called Vengeance, and you know Vengeance, that was yeah. that was actually a feature well feature length one. So yeah, I'm there in the beginning, and now they're doing Vengeance too. So I went up again, and they did a whole bunch of more scenes, and they have one more they still need to do with me. So I'm going up there next week, I think it is, you know, to shoot an additional scene. Um, there's some real surprises in this new one in terms of alumni that's in this film. Um, as Jason, Jason's Risen, you know, had uh, um, uh, what the, the uh, what's her name, uh, the, the lead actress in the first one. I keep oh. want to say Kimberly. That's not Kimberly. Kimberly is the other actress. I can't remember uh, her name. To save my life. You're talking about the the one, the younger girl, right? Not uh, the, the blonde girl that starts the on the you know that's the good girl that kills Mrs. Voorhees at the end. Um, I can't think of her character's name right now. Um, mm. So you're uh, I know, the actress is Bethany Adrian. Palmer. No, not Betsy Palmer. A no, Adrian, the, Adrian King is the Adrian actress. Adrian King. Yep, yep, yep. But I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the character. Um, anyway, so yeah, Jane Alice Harden. was what they called her. In the Alice. There you yeah. go. Thank you. <laughs> um, so she's in. You know, she does this incredible. You know, appearance in Jason's Risen, and. There's, you know, uh, Never Hike Alone. And then he, he uh, Vincent, who did that one, who very Friday the 13th savvy, like I can't believe, you know, he did then did a you know, Never Hike Alone in the Snow. Mm -hmm. Ironically, he was writing at the same time I was writing mine, but I announced mine. And then he called me, goes, you're not going to believe this. I'm doing one too. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it, it happens. I'm sure the idea has been floating around for a while. Oh, yeah. um, but what he did, what he did in his is totally different way than what I'm doing uh, and, or what I want to do. And mine is just way too expensive to try to do it as a fan funded thing. So I've got to wait if I want to do this particular story. Right. Uh, but yeah, it, it, the fan films have been some really good ones. There have been some ones that have just like some good ideas in there, just not well executed. But the bottom line is it's giving people a chance to, you know, see another interpretation of a Jason story, which I think is just amazing. Yeah. And I mean, even kids nowadays, like my son, he's 13 and he'll be playing this Friday the 13th with all of his little buddies. And I keep telling him like, have y'all ever actually, you know, watched all these films? Do you know who you're playing or what you're doing yeah. or why, or any of the basis of it? And you know, my son has, because I'm a big horror movie guy. So even at an early age, I was fortunate enough where I worked for a long period of time. I had a job where I would work four days and then I was off for four days. Mm -hmm. So during the summertime, me and him would just stay up all night and binge watch horror movies when my days off and he was out of school. So it didn't matter. And I picked up the Blu-ray Friday, the 13th box. Yep. Set. I don't know if you that, see it. It's very that, yeah. fucking cool. That's and the, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's got all all of them in there. I mean, it's just really cool. The special features on those things are awesome. Um, you know, and being able to get them, you know, remastered and cleaned up, it's just really cool. So we'll burn through them. And, you know, when he has his friends over, I'll tell him, like, y'all go out. I got a projector in my garage. So the garage in itself is kind of creepy enough. So we'll go out there and I'll put them on a projector. And it's got a big uh, speaker, like bar, whatever, a uh, sound bar. And it gets pretty creepy out there. And one night I had him out there watching it and I have a code on the outside where I can open it up. And it was like two in the morning. I snuck out the back where they couldn't see me put on like the full Jason, get up, you know, the mask and everything as, as best I could. I didn't have anything, you know, I could go around the back of my head and all that, but you know, left that thing up just a little bit, you know, about so high and then put my head in there. And I mean, I thought they were going to put a fucking hole through the wall trying yeah. to get in there to get back into the house yeah. so i mean you know years later those things still resonate with fans your movie like i said is it's probably my favorite man it, six and seven are are together right there to me is the best ones in this series um obviously you know one is you know it's the first one so it's going to hold a special place 
but just from the cool factor and the changing of the times and the rock and roll aspect and everything, I thought six was just perfect on the money. I think I would appreciate it a whole lot more probably in that time. If I was older, I was just a younger kid, but even now, I mean, I'm the eighties is probably like my favorite decade. I listen to eighties music. I love horror movies from the eighties and, and stuff like that. So it, it really hit home to me. And then, like you said, I know we're focusing more on Jason six, but all the other stuff that you've done, you know, sometimes they come back was another great one. Um, you know, that was a fantastic movie. Did you, did you have anything to do with the sequel to that? They had a sequel to that, didn't they? No, that was another one of those idiot uh, business decisions on my part, because uh, the, the movie, uh, I, I did date with an angel with Dino De Laurentiis. Mm -hmm. And basically, unfortunately for Dino, he had, you know, created this studio, DEG, and he hired some of the biggest directors that, around, you know, at that time, Peter Bogdanovich and William Friedkin and Bruce Beresford and stuff. But every movie that was done uh, there just failed. And a lot of it was because they weren't distributed and exhibited in the right way. They didn't find the audience and stuff. So when I'm making mine, you know, I'm watching all these other guys going off the end of, <laughs> of the plank. And when it got to me, um, Michael Knight and I, uh, like when we were doing uh, Date with an Angel, you know, we came back from the promotional tour to find out Dino you know, had declared bankruptcy. So that movie kind of opened and closed in a weekend. And I went, all right, you know, I took so long to get it made and that was it. And, but it ended up having kind of a cult following on, on DVD and I just did the Blu-ray with, with um, commentary. So when he offered me, you know, uh, Stephen King, sometimes they come back and he said, you know, we can do the two things for you, Tom. We can, uh, you know, pay you double to do it right now or I give you so you can do all the sequels, you know, first choice, you know. And I went, I'll take double up front because I... <laughs> And of course, it who knew it was going to spawn, you know, two two more sequels out of the thing. Well, but, that's right. It did have a third one, didn't it? I don't, yeah. I don't know if I ever watched the third one. I know I watched the second one. That was sometimes they come back again, and mm -hmm. it was a really interesting concept too. I and mean, what was the lead? Uh, Tim, what's his Matheson? Was that the lead in? That, that was in mine. No. Yeah, in yours. Yeah. I mean, that dude's been acting forever. Yeah, he's great. I mean, still, still acting now. Uh, he's in some show. My wife is watching. Oh, I said this is us or some show she's yeah. watching. Um, but I remembered him from uh, the movie Buried Alive. Remember when he yeah. got a, his wife thought she killed him? They put him in a coffin. He dug his way out and come back yeah. and basically boxed them into their own kind of coffin in the middle of the house. Yeah, that, that movie was just cutting edge for the time too. And just I, I thought it was really, really well done. Yeah. Um, and and that was actually a surprise to me because back then I was just watching movies. I wasn't really into who was directing. And when I was went back and looked and I seen you directed, I was like, I could notice a little theme there through all those movies. And you kind of make a transition from doing the monsters to the real life crime, like we talked about, you know, before we got on air. Do you appreciate or not appreciate be the wrong word? Do you enjoy doing, you know, movies like that where it's more real to like a real person or were you kind of partial to the monster movies like Jason? What's your favorite? It's I love both. And there one is very much like, you know, I, I, and I, I don't know if other people do, but I do. I break things down into movies and films. And to me, a movie is like an entertainment piece. It exists kind of there. It, you don't have to take it seriously. You know, you can just have fun with it. It, you know, you know, my Friday the 13th to me was a movie. It wasn't a film. You know, when I did Date with an Angel, again, it was a movie, not a film. But when you start doing these more character-driven, intimate, you know, I, I just think it, it's a different kind of way we approach them it's like we're we're asking even if it's not based on a true story we're asking you to believe these characters are real people and they really exist and these they have backstories you know which i give the actors you know you came from here and here and here and here and this is what happened just before this scene happened and you know you know what's going to happen later on but not what your fate is but you just know you know i'm going to 7-eleven after this or, you know, I, I this, this whole scene, I got to go to the bathroom. So that's part of the reason you're so antsy, but right. nobody knows that. It's just like, you know, why is he so antsy? I don't know. I mean, it's like we do in life. There's things that happen and it affects whatever's going on. So I try to approach the cinematography 
in that way? Does it feel like the characters, it feel like the world they're in, the lighting, the costumes, everything? It's a much more kind of created artistic approach to cinema um, as a film to me. So to get a chance at making a movie, you know, at any time, I mean, that's great fun because you can sort of, okay, we make movie logic, but we don't make real human logic out of it because right. there's certain things that you can get away with the movies, but if you're trying to get the audience to believe somebody is actually does this or could do this, to me, you've really got to, you know, do your homework and get us so into that tone that we, we really believe it. And um, obviously, you know, what Toby did with Texas Chainsaw, you know, was a film. It was, we, right. we, you know, things were like, oh shit, that really happened. Or Blair Witch felt like it really happened. You know, it wasn't like, you know, certain, you know, like Frankenstein, Dracula, which were much more theatrical, much more movie-ish to me. Right. Yeah, it's definitely scarier when, like you, like we said earlier, if it's something that we think can really happen, that that guy could really do this, that guy could really take a chainsaw and just, you know, go to town on people. So yeah. I agree with you 100%. Well, look, man, we couldn't thank you enough for stopping by the show. I certainly appreciate it. Like I said, it's been an honor for me to have you on. One of my favorite movies growing up as a kid, my first Jason film that I ever seen growing up as a kid. So it holds a special place in my heart. And uh, I'm glad that you were able to stop by the show and kind of give us some behind the scenes stuff on there and, and talk about your career. And we certainly appreciate you stopping by. Well, great. I think a great meeting you, Chip. And, you know, love, love, to, love to hear that all the things that you do in the wonderful world of being a, a great horror fan, you know, with your garage and passing it right on down to your son. And maybe he'll be out there scaring people one day, too. Absolutely. I hope so. Well, look here, <laughs> man. I've had a blast. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Tom McLaughlin. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Tune in next week for an all new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Tom, appreciate it, my friend.